So I'm curious, how did you get so good, essentially? How did you get so good, Michael? Because there's a lot of people that, you know, it's not just, clearly not just time. Like, you know, there's a lot of people that have been training for as long as you and aren't as skilled as you. What did you do different? I was willing to experiment a bunch and I didn't put any kind of timelines on it at all. And I was willing at a certain stage to work with the dog that was in front of me, like in the working dog circles, a lot of times, um, if a dog isn't a, like a first class specimen, people aren't going to spend any, they'll, they'll wash it. Right. And, um, it's not like I haven't had dogs that I didn't keep, but the, I, I've done it with a lot of dogs and I've worked some marginal dogs in training too. And I, and as a decoy, I've worked lots of marginal dogs and helped them be successful. So I think part of it is that there's developing techniques that work with a wider variety of dogs and being flexible and not feeling like there's one way to do it or there's a certain specific timeline. I, I've not fallen victim to that the whole way along, which I think still allowed me to develop some ways of approaching things that that are that are effective with a wide range of dogs including the dogs that aren't always perfect specimens right uh, of what they're doing well hey michael welcome to the show Thank you very much for having me, Nick. It's a pleasure meeting you, or meeting you sort of. <laughs> no, it's really good to have you on your, uh, I think for any podcaster, and I know that this is maybe, uh, maybe I don't know whether you like to hear this because it's kind of maybe a little bit of an ego boost for you, but you're definitely going to be one of the most requested top guests. You know, someone, I think that a lot of people really, uh, you've just inspired so many people, you know, and uh, so it's, it's, yeah, Thank a massive. You. Kind of, it's kind of an honor, to be honest, to to have you on the podcast. I really appreciate it. That means a lot. Thank you. I really appreciate that. That's kind. I know that this is a cliche question to start with, but I kind of, I I, I want to know anyway. So you've you've probably been asked this before, but um, what what first got you interested in dogs? Like, how did you like come into this essentially? Yeah. So. Uh... I'm interested in all critters from the time I could walk. Uh, and so uh, I was a little bit animal obsessed. So I think from the time I was five or six, I was bugging my parents to get a dog. Um, they finally caved when I was entering junior high school. So I was 12 when they let me get a German Shepherd puppy. And uh, the deal was, of course, that if I got a dog, I was going to be responsible, including training the dog. And so I took an obedience class at the local German Shepherd dog club when I was in junior high and that sort of sent me down a path. I met a woman there who uh, had a kennel near where I lived. And so she was into dog shows. And so I went to dog shows with her. I went start to kennel sit and the whole thing, I just sent me down a path. And from that point on, I was sort of fascinated. I think like lots of people, when I entered it, you have a complete, and I was a kid of course, but it's still true at no matter what age you kind of enter the world of dog training uh you don't really know what it what you're getting into like people have an idea of what dogs are and what dog training is and then you get into it and you're like oh wow it's, it's not what i thought at all but it was better than i thought it was more interesting than i thought and so that sent me down the path so your first dog was a german shepherd right correct yeah so, so when did you get your first mali 1990 so how did that come about because I think from what I've heard, there was a time when Mallies were <laughs> were not as popular, right? Like it wasn't Absolutely. such a wasn't such a big. It was very German Shepherd dominated at one point, yep. right? Absolutely. So um, it was. I was about when I was graduating high school. Um, I was at a dog show with German Shepherds at a dog show in Ohio, and they had a demonstration at the dog show of police and work and Schutzend at the time. And so I was like, ooh, I wanna do that, right? And so when I came home from that, I looked for a club near us and I started going out and none of the dogs that I had at the time were suitable at all. Like they were American show line German Shepherds, so completely unsuitable. So I began to look for a like working line German Shepherd. And I had 
uh, several of them, and they all had something not working at a various point. Either they, if they were good workers, they had a health problem or whatever it was. And so I just started to think about getting another dog. And the club, one of the clubs that I trained with a lot was a Rottweiler club. And so I was really seriously considering a Rottweiler. I was looking at giant schnauzers. I looked at Bouviers. I had a pit bull for a while and an American bulldog in there. Um, and then someone in our club uh, got a Malinois, brought it in from Europe. Uh, and no, it was my first contact with the breed at all. And um, I'm like, oh, those are kind of cool. And it turns out that a friend, um, uh, his mom was Belgian and his dad was an American serviceman. And he had Rottweilers, but he went to Belgium to visit his mom. And he came back with a bunch of videotapes of Belgian ring sport and all these Malinois. And he's like, you got to see these things. And I'm like, wow, look at that. I got to have one of those. And it just so happened that the first Malinois I got was an, was a nice dog. It was a good dog. Um, um, and we just clicked immediately. It was like everything that I wanted in a training dog, they had, uh, the, and from that point on, there was no real turning back. I was obsessed with them. And still am. I got a house full. <laughs> yeah, I know that's why I bring it up. Did you? Did uh, you have to import that dog? No. So actually, the the friend, his name was Gary DeHue, um, and I, I've lost track of him now. He was on the East Coast a, a number of years ago, but he went back to Belgium, bought a couple of adult Belgian ring dogs, and uh, and and bought a couple of females as well. And he brought them back over here, and and there was a litter of puppies, and I got. A, a puppy, a dog from his first litter. Oh, yeah. okay. So, get to, what kind of age were you here then? Because we're going for a bit of a time scale thing here. Because you were talking yeah, so, a minute, a minute ago yeah. about getting your first Jim Shepherd, and now we're kind of several dogs later already. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, I got my first German Shepherd when I was twelve. I had them all through high school and things like that. So, in nineteen ninety, I would have been twenty four, twenty five when I got my first Malinois old yeah. enough to do what you wanted <laughs> old enough to do what I wanted exactly right <laughs> exactly right exactly right yep yeah, yeah. So you actually it sounds like you had actually you had several dogs and so you you actually had quite a lot of dog. you like you weren't one of these people that just had one dog for a long time you oh no. yeah I think pretty much that very first German Shepherd, and I totally don't recommend people do this, but the very first German Shepherd that I had was a pet store German Shepherd, right? And uh, when I was in, I was probably a freshman in, in, in high school, uh, we bred her to a dog and she was, she was a lovely pet dog, but she was not in any way what would people would consider a German Shepherd <laughs> yeah, yeah. standard by any stretch. And so, and we kept a puppy from that, that I did obedience stuff with and AKC obedience and things like that. So we had a pretty quickly, we had two dogs and then I got really into the show dog thing. And so those two dogs are getting older, um, but they weren't, weren't suitable for what the American confirmation show dog was. And so I got went to a well-known show breeder and got a show dog from them. And so I had three or four dogs really? all through oh. high school. Yeah. I didn't realize then, you were into confirmation as well. But I, oh, yeah. Yeah. Like the antithesis of what I'm into now. Like I, <laughs> I, I can't. I can't even, I mean, I understand the impulse, but now I, I think so much uh, damage is done ultimately to the to dog's temperament by selecting too much for what they look like. And it's really difficult to, to get everything in one dog. So my experience now with confirmation is that um, they make compromises, but the compromises usually come with temperament and health, not instead of looks, because that's the easiest thing to select for, right? Is and that... So, is that the realization you had that put you off of confirmation? No, what put me off of confirmation was I had no idea about what working dogs were until that that initial uh, experience. I think I probably had a similar perception from lots of people that biting dogs were dangerous and all that. And so when I first saw that first demo, I was like 17 or 18 or wherever I was. I first saw that. I was like, oh, that's cool. I got to check that out. And then as soon as I was into the working dog thing, that was it. Like I was, I was bitten. I'm mean, like, that is amazing. And I've always been kind of into dogs doing dog things, like whether it's sled dogs or hunting dogs or any of that kind of stuff. Any dogs that ha that are performed to do tasks or I, I'm really into. So I guess the thing that probably most people know you for are the Learberg or the, all the content that came out with Learberg. How, yes. how did that come about? 
Um, actually, I was traveling full time on the seminar circuit. So before I opened our school here, um, I traveled full time giving seminars to dog clubs and organizations for almost four, 15 years, 13 years, I guess, or so. Um, and so I was doing a seminar in the Midwest and Cindy Rhodes, who is um, Ed's wife now, but was his girlfriend at the time, uh, she came to a seminar uh, and we kind of clicked and she went back and told Ed like, hey, you should come check this out. And so Ed came to a, a sem another seminar that I did and watched. And then he asked me at that seminar, hey, would you like to do videos? And I said, I'd love to, but I'm traveling all the time and I don't have any time to kind of script and sit down and shoot that. And he said, well, I'll just come to seminars and I'll videotape you at seminars. And so those initial, all those very first videos which were shot during dog training seminars. And he just went back and did his thing with it. And I honestly didn't pay any attention at all to, I'm like, great, thanks, <laughs> right? I didn't look at them or edit them or do anything. And then as we went along, I got way more involved and started to sort of script videos and, and that kind of thing. But that was the start of the relationship. And it was hugely beneficial to me because I'm, I'm not somebody that really likes to market myself. I can't stand kind of talking about I'm not, I, I'm not a salesman at all. It's not my jam. It rubs me the wrong way. And so Ed was doing all of that for me, like without me saying a word. So he would put stuff out there. So he's been a, a huge help to me in getting me established at, at that spot. So I'll well, forever great. When you put those out initially, were they like, and it, did it instantly just blow up straight away or was it more of like a slow, slow? They, it, it, it went pretty well. So it, they came out right around the time that I was wanting to stop traveling. So just a tiny bit before, or right around the same time that I was opening the school actually is when the first videos were dropping. Um, me, I, I can't remember if they were right before or right around or just after. Um, and so uh, I had been traveling a whole bunch and had a, a kind of reputation among dog trainers, which is what sort of drove me to open a school for trainers instead of just open a dog training business. Um, and so there's no doubt that those coming out, in addition to the reputation I'd earned doing seminars, there was immediate kind of interest in the school. And those things kind of went hand in hand. So for sure, they they got a fair amount of attention and then people started to come to the school and it, they, it sort of turned into a two-way feedback loop for it. Oh, nice. So when you when you first started doing all of these seminars and stuff like that, how, how did that kind of come to be was that because of your success in mondio ring or was that igp at that point or it was igp at that, it was igp at that point and actually it, it came about it, it the first one outside of my, there were the first one i did was kind of an informal thing for a club that i used to train with so the club that i used to train with in san diego had a bunch of new members and somebody said hey would you come in and do a little clinic thing for the new members just to teach them a little bit of stuff so i did and it went kind of well. And there was um, a trainer uh, that had been down for a trial and we started talking and said, hey, you do that kind of thing? Uh, actually, Tammy McLeod, um, who was, used to be Tammy Stevenson, was married to an IGP judge. And so she had me come up to her training group and then they told somebody else and they invited me and I went to another. And at first it was, you know, to people would go, well, Hey, you know, somebody will do a seminar and I'm like, sure, I'll do a seminar. And it was just a, a kind of casual thing. I had no intention of turning it into a job or anything like that. Um, and it just gradually word of mouth. I didn't do any, I didn't have a website. I didn't do anything. I just, people would call, email and say, Hey, I hear you do seminars. I've heard good things. You want to come out? And I'm like, sure. <laughs> and, uh, about the time my wife got into grad school in New York, which would have been 2000 to in 2000. Um, it was starting to pick up steam. And so we moved back to New York. So I didn't have a regular job. So I did some pet dog training stuff. Um, and then the seminar thing just kept picking up steam. And so within a couple of years after we were back East, I was doing that full time. I was traveling so, so well, a, a ton, 40 weeks a year probably by that time. Yeah. That's a hell of a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay okay well so, so at what point did that switch between from igp to mondio ring i'm really curious about the kind of popularization yeah. of mondio ring actually like absolutely uh, like how did that that sport get so, to be so popular right so i came up of course in igp started in the late 80s 
and into the early 90s and was still doing that, I went to a French ring seminar. And, and, and let me say that my initial introduction to the Malinois was uh, through the Belgian ring dogs because of my friend that went to Belgium, Gary, that had gone to Belgium. And so when I saw that Belgian ring, I was like, wow, that's it for me, right? And I still think that Belgian ring is the best program for making breeding dogs, right? I love the, the NVBK program. It's an incredibly thorough program. So I, I had in my mind that that was what a Malinois was, but IGP Schutzend was what's available and that's what we were doing. So in 1993, Michel Valadon, a French trainer came to California and did a French ring seminar there. And I was like, oh, I want to check out ring sport. I want to see some, what suit work is. And I went to that and I, we started messing the, some of the guys in my club started messing with suit work and French ring at that point in time. So my Schutzen dog of the time, I began to cross train for French ring um, at that stage. And then there was Neil Wallace did a, a Mondio ring seminar. I want to probably somewhere in the mid nineties, 95 or 96 or somewhere in that range um, in the US and, and it was paired with a decoy certification. So I went to that and that felt closer to Belgian ring to me, right? I'm like, oh, it borrows elements of Belgian ring and French ring and the Belgian ring is what I really wanted to do. And so at that point I got my certification as a Mondio ring decoy and I started doing that. But at the, I was still training, there weren't any Mondio trials. So we were doing Mondio-esque kind of things while still doing French ring. And then gradually I leaned more and more into the Mondio side of it. And the, we started to have a few more trials here in the States and it started to pick up enough that I shifted my focus off of French ring and onto Mondio ring. Um, and I was traveling mostly doing seminars at, uh, at IGP clubs, but I drag my suit and the stuff like that with me. And I would plant a couple of Mondia ring seeds everywhere I went. Right. So I'd go to a club, but a lot of the, the most active Mondia ring clubs in the U S now were IGP clubs that I was going to doing seminars. And I, I'm like, Hey, you guys should try a little of this. And they gradually, I polluted them with Mondio ring. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting because I feel like the, and I'm no authority to talk about this by any means, but I feel like in the UK, we're like seeing Mondio really gain in popularity over the last kind of five to 10 years. Whereas it's really been like, we have our own sports, I guess we had like working trials for years and years and years. And then IGP has been around and is still around and, you know, has, is probably the biggest of the protection sports here in the UK, yeah. but Mondio is really like in the last five to 10 years, it's like really seems to have like noticeably grown. Oh, and I, so I wondered if there was anything from that you saw in, in America, like that contributed to the growth in a big way. What contributed ultimately was the, when we figured out how to train ring sport. So in the early days with both French ring and Mondio ring, there were, we were basically treating the dogs like IGP dogs. That's what we knew, right? So we were trying to do IGP style obedience and the, our approach to bite work and everything was much more influenced by that because that's what we knew. Um, and there would be a seminar, but what the French trainers or the European trainers that came over to do, that didn't feel like anything we were at all familiar with. So in the States, when Mondia Ring started, there was a lot of floundering. There were many trials in which nobody passed. Like you'd have a trial where we'd have eight ring one dogs and nobody would pass, right? And so over the next, let's say between 1995, when it probably, or 96, when it first touched ground here, um, to the early 2000s, it didn't grow very much. There were not that many clubs. There weren't that many trials. You know, everybody that was doing it knew each other and spread out all over the US. And gradually we figured out what it was to put together a ring dog from the ground up with a plan to make ring three, right? And we had enough experience and enough decoys that had the skills. And then things really started to take off. Then, and it's still, it's a hard, they're, they're, it's a hard sport, right? So it's, it's really challenging for people to, to stick with it. So the numbers have grown steadily, but you get a lot of people come in for a bit and then they disappear and then new people replace them. And so the overall numbers, it hasn't grown as much as you'd think, 
but now the training is good. There are clubs, there are numerous clubs around the country that know how to finish a dog from start to finish. And they're consistently turning out well-trained dogs, right? Kind of thing. But it was, it was the training knowledge was the big deal. It was collecting the, the training experience to actually help new people along. Yeah. I think that's hard with protection sports as well, because you're so reliant on having helpers and decoys and, oh, yeah. and you know, it's kind of hard to get that snowball rolling, isn't it? When there isn't really anyone about. <laughs> oh, yeah. Everyone's just messing around, like trying to figure it out. Like, well, how would you do this? I don't know. Like, and the, all the, the technique and the suit work, there's so much to be, you, you, it's a team effort. There's no way you're training a Mondi or a ring dog or, or, or any ring dog, but without uh, any of the protection sports ultimately, but even more so in the ring sports, you're even more decoy reliant. There are a variety of exercises that are completely taught by your decoy, right? In IGP, you need a good decoy, mm -hmm. but a lot of the structure of the exercises can be constructed without the decoy. That's not so much the case in, in, in the ring sports. You need the decoy to do the teaching actually. One thing I notice when I speak to you and when I speak to Ivan is obviously you both have a lot of experiences on the other side of that relationship in terms of like the decoy or the helper. How important do you think that is to having success in the sports? Because there's a lot of people that compete that don't necessarily ever really do the the other side if that makes sense yeah. so i'm just curious if you think that's a really if that you know if there's a lot of value in that essentially i think there's a huge amount of value in it it's obviously not necessary because there are successful trainers that do it without they'll have to have to form a relationship with a good decoy to get the work done but i can't imagine a well-rounded understanding of protection sports without having done some decoy work at the very least. And I've learned so much about reading dogs and the feel of um, training by by doing decoy work, right? It, it, a lot of the, the skills that are applicable in play are coming from decoy work. The way you move, how much tension you put on things, like recognizing early signs that a dog's stressing and learning how to alter what's happening kind of knowing what a progression feels like a lot of the stuff you can't see, you feel it. Like by the time you're seeing a dog behaving badly, you're too late. Right. Whereas if you're in the suit or sleeve, you're right there and you feel it start to happen before things come unwound, for example. Uh, so I think it's incredibly helpful. And certainly my understanding of dogs has been expanded uh, immensely through, through decoy work, but it's, it's not essential. There are tons of good trainers out there that don't do decoy work, right? But I can't imagine a life without having done it. <laughs> yeah, I imagine it's extremely helpful because sometimes it feels like access to a helper is like a really precious resource. You know? uh -huh. And I, I, I'm really curious about how it changes your approach as well, because a lot of people, I, I'm like a newbie to the protection sports. I'm learning a lot awesome. and I'm getting a lot of uh, advice from people. And it seems like, a lot of people say, and, and maybe you'll agree, maybe you won't, I don't know, Michael, but like a lot of people say, when you have a young dog, you don't actually need to do huge amounts of protection, that really you just need to kind of like keep it, you know what I mean? Like just show them a little <laughs> bit, but but you don't need to do loads of it. But I'm yeah. curious though, if if you have those skills yourself, if you find that you actually, you find yourself actually doing more with the dog and what right. impact that has on a dog. Yes, uh, I think there's there's truth in in that saying that you don't have to do a ton, right? And a, a lot of people kind of overdo the adolescent dog, the puppy and adolescent dog protection work. There's no doubt about it, right? Um, let's let me come at it this way. I would say that um, I do less protection work now than I did 20 years ago with puppies and young dogs. But I still think there's a lot of benefit and it's dependent on the type of dog you have. So there's a type of dog that really benefits from that young dog work done correctly. And then there's a type of dog where it's not that beneficial. And so if I get a dog that's maybe a little bit low threshold, notices some stuff in the world, is not the most confident puppy or young dog, um, but they have a lot of motivation, I can use that motivation through puppy bite work or adolescent bite work 
to build their confidence and condition them uh, to be stronger uh, around different things. Whereas if I have a really solid dog that doesn't have many issues and a higher threshold, that if I keep doing lots of protection work with them, they start to ramp up a lot and I outstrip my obedience with the young dog, right? So I get out of balance. So the dogs get more and more into the protection work, but they're too young for me to add lots of controls to it. And so if I keep doing it, one, I can't progress because I can't add the control piece. Or if I start adding the control piece, it's a little too soon for them. And I need to let my obedience catch up. So it's a little bit of a balance game between like, do I do some protection? Good, your head's in it. Okay, let's leave it alone while we get your control things into place. And then we come back and forth. But some dogs benefit a lot, but it needs to be done well too. And that's part of the problem. The younger the dog, the more fragile they are. So what can tend to happen for people is if they say, oh, my puppy would benefit from this work. And if somebody doesn't do a good job, they give the puppy a bad experience. And that has a way bigger impact on a young dog than it would on an older dog. And so a lot of people that don't kind of specialize in young dog work, they're like, ah, just don't do too much. Wait till they're a little more mature. They'll be a little more resilient to bad experiences and you won't get out of balance. Um, but I think I, I really enjoy working with puppies and adolescent dogs. So I do as much bite work as I think is productive for that dog, which is quite a bit for some dogs and very little for others based on my read of the dog. Yeah, that's dog training for you, isn't it? It's so nuanced. <laughs> <laughs> it's what you do for one dog is different to what you might do for another. And I guess that's actually one of the really hard things about learning online, isn't it? You know, because there's nothing there's no way of replicating getting that experience in person. And I, I think that's actually one thing that's quite worrying for anyone that is new to any sport is the constant fear of, am I going to screw this up? Oh yeah. <laughs> Paralyzing. You're exactly right. And, it, and, and you have to, you have to get past that. Like, yes, you're going to screw it up. Like we still screw it up. Like it doesn't matter how long you've done it. Yeah. Oops. Shouldn't have done that. Went a little too far there. Oops. Shouldn't have done that. Uh, you know, so that's going to happen for the rest of your life. But if you, the amount of um, information that's available to people now is almost overwhelming, right? So you had to accumulate that information way more slowly in the past and you would get an idea. Ivan and I have talked about this a lot, right? This idea, we go to a seminar or something. And after the seminar, we're left by ourselves again with our club mates. And we're like, well, let's just goof around with it. Let's see where it is. And so we would have time to play with that, to kind of mess around and find out where the edges of it were like, oops, that didn't work so well. Or, oh, I see. And you got to play with it. Now, big progressions will be laid out for you through online information or courses. There's a lot of information. There's somebody that'll give you a, like a kind of an outline of the whole thing. But with that comes a kind of paralysis, a fear that like, I know there's a right way to do it and there's a wrong way to do it. And I can't, I'm so afraid to do something wrong that people don't do stuff. They don't get the feel because the only way to get the feel is to fail, to mess around, to push a little and try things. And so you keep that kind of experimental mindset with all the information. It's a hard thing. It's a hard thing for new trainers now. And I meet a lot of trainers that have that same problem where they're, they're going like, uh, I'm so afraid that I haven't done anything with this because I'm afraid to mess the dog up. Right. Yeah. And it is yeah, it is paralyzing. I know what you mean. And uh, I think you just, I, I think there's nothing you can do other than just kind of get over it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you do. You got to be willing to uh, F around and find out. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way of but um, I know exactly what you mean from the pet dog world. Even I get clients that are like, hey, I read this thing online and, you know, it's like, oh, that would be good advice for a certain kind of dog. But um, actually, I don't think it really fits your dog. You know, um, yeah. and and that's that's a that's the problem with uh, even books. I guess even when you read a book, you can have the same problem when you're just kind of trying to speak to like a general audience. But I'm curious about how you developed your training style because it seems I think, and I'm guessing here that a part, big reason that it kind of resonated with so many people was because it was kind of a little bit unique. Like it was kind of different. It seems like um, you know, for a long time especially when you when you think about uh, the protection sports the training was oftentimes super like old school and uh you know uh, like they always people always to wear yank and crank you know and and actually your training seems in like 
quite reward based, you know. And I, and you know, sometimes when I think about it, I think actually you probably contributed to like reward based dog training more than like you you're up there on that list, you know, really because you really introduced uh, like training with rewards to a lot of people that um, probably weren't really hearing it beforehand. Yeah, I, th- I, I feel a little bit lucky in just the timing of my my landing on Earth and the career, <laughs> the trajectory. When I learned training initially, um, it was straight up healer method, six foot obedient, six foot leash, choke chain, escape and avoidance style training. That was what was available. Certainly, if anybody was doing anything different, I wasn't aware of it. And I don't know people that were aware of it, that all obedience was done that way. And so you're young, you're naive, you don't know anything. And people say, this is how you train. And it never felt good to me. Like that kind of training isn't a lot of fun. Right. And, but it's effective. And at the end product is you have a dog that listens to you and does stuff. And so there's, there's a satisfaction in that. Um, and I was naive enough, like, to go, okay, this is what you have to do. I, the people say, this is what you do. And this is what you have to do. So I could lean in and I could learn that method. And I committed to it enough to learn it and, and train dogs. And so, and then I was around for the beginning of what we, I, I call it the reward-based revolution, but the point in dog training when, you know, marine mammal trainers, et cetera, were beginning to do care. People like Karen Pryor and Gary Wilkes were beginning to do seminars for dog trainers and, um, I went to some clicker seminars and things like that. And I said, oh, this is really interesting. And it seemed like a lot more fun than what we were doing. And so I kind of dove in wholeheartedly. And around the same time, um, uh, I met Ivan and he and I were coming up very similar. He was still in California at the time. We were friends. And so we would train together and bounce ideas off each other. And um, for whatever reason, I kind of immediately realized that this had direct application to what we were doing right in the protection world even though that wasn't how we were doing it and the early work we did there was way more of what i call reward as an apology right so you would just get the dog all jacked up with a toy and then you'd crank on him with a prong or whatever it was and then then at the end you'd heal around and at the end you'd throw their ball for him or whatever right but we hadn't incorporated the idea of breaking it down in small pieces and teaching the dog all the pieces of the behavior to access a reward so once i realized that the power of that we and started playing with it it was like an immediate change in how i kind of thought about dog training like Overnight, I was like, this is, this is completely different. This is going to change everything. And so because I was willing to embrace that, and um, I spent a lot of time doing seminars for very traditional Schutzen and IGP clubs and things like that, and trying to promote play-based rewards and use of conditioned reinforcers and that whole nine yards. And so I really got a lot of practice teaching that to a skeptical kind of audience as I traveled a lot in the beginning. Uh, And then of course you run up against the limits of the purely reward-based stuff. And we, you start to kind of go, okay, where's the balance between all this? Where's the sweet spot? And where do I get the advantages of the traditional training and the advantages of the modern training? And we, we find a way. So I feel just lucky that I landed where I did when I did. And that allowed me to kind of have a foot in both of those worlds. So I could speak to those people. I knew I wasn't like I hadn't done that kind of work. And I was somebody coming in and telling you, you guys are doing everything wrong. I'm like, guys, what, Hey, men and women, th- like, this is amazing. Like this is going to really change how we're doing things. How did people respond to that? You know, were you seen as the kind of crazy extreme you know? <laughs> a little bit, a little bit, right? So, uh, of course, a lot of the, a lot of the first, the early clubs that I went to uh, as uh, uh, doing seminars, they were the people that were already interested in kind of what I was doing, the way I was talking about training. So, but then as we went along, I'd get a lot of these situations where somebody in a in a club somewhere wanted to change what they were doing. So they're like, "Hey, we're doing a seminar. We should bring in this guy." And then they had a bunch of more traditionalists in the club who were going to be very highly skeptical. So I went to a lot of clubs where there were two or three people in the club that were really on board with this idea. And then a number of people that were like, yeah, this food training, all this 
play is all bullshit kind of thing, right? So they were very skeptical of that. But I didn't take that personally. I actually looked at that as kind of the job and a, and a kind of a challenge. Like I, I could very quickly kind of identify the person in the room that was going to be the skeptic. And I'm like, okay, my whole weekend is about convincing you that this has merit, right? <laughs> and that became kind of the game with it. So, but yeah, there were people that definitely thought I was a like hippie flower child. No, that, that, <laughs> that, this, this doesn't I mean, apply to action sports and all that kind of thing. There's no you, doubt about it. Did you ever have any like really, does any experiences come to mind? Like, did you have any really bad ones or? or... No, actually, I, I remarkably, I didn't. I had people that I knew didn't, didn't like me right off the bat, didn't like my vibe and didn't want to believe what I was saying. But I, to be honest, I think... I could reach most of those people given enough time. Yeah. Right? Because I could talk about the old ways we did it and I had experience there. I'm like, yeah, I've done a million force fetches. I know how that works, right? Let's talk about like having the dog not learn under stress, right? This idea that, hey, we can show the dog some things and some preparatory work that's going to make that we won't deal with the same fallout. And if I could explain that well and show them, then... And I, and I never took it personally, so I, I I didn't get defensive about it. And so I think most of those people, like, even if they didn't buy in completely, I won them over enough so that they would begrudgingly say, yeah, that, that looks like it could be useful. Right. Being at the beginning of that, like, that kind of change in the way dog training was done in the protection sports, that must have been quite surreal. Because I imagine that you kind of had to, like, you were coming up with, new methods all of the time as opposed to like nowadays you know if you want to learn something you can look online and there's like a hundred different courses <laughs> you, you know like there's always yeah. like something that you you know you can always stand on the shoulder of giants very easily versus back at that time you kind of had to be quite creative i would imagine yeah and i i, I think that's true that there were, we did a lot of messing around like we did a lot of experimenting um and I think that there, there's a benefit to that. Like, uh, and I, I mentioned it before was the idea that I didn't, we don't, we weren't, we didn't have a big picture view of it at the time. Like the way we're all talking about different dog training methodologies and stuff like that, that, that was less of a discussion in the dog training community so much, right. Other than like, is this technique work or not work kind of thing. It wasn't the kind of meta analysis of, of, uh, all these dog training philosophies and how they mirror what's happening culturally or whatever like, that's going on now, which is fun, but it, it wasn't there. And we had a lot of opportunity to play around with stuff. And so we did. And I think that that was hugely beneficial. I could try something and have it not work, but without big consequence. Like it didn't feel like now, I think people feel like everything they do is watched and they can't, they couldn't just try something out and have it not go well it, because it would reflect on them because of the, you know, the social media and the internet culture kind of thing. And we didn't have any of that. So the, I, I think, yeah, we, you get a better understanding of, of all these principles. If you goof around with them, if you take them and go like, well, how would I apply it? And there was nobody there to tell you, oh, this is how you do it over here. I'm like, these principles make sense to me. Okay. Well, how would I use it in a Holden bark or how would I use it if I was trying to, you know, teach the hold in the retrieve or whatever it was. And uh, so we just goofed around a lot with it and played with it, which gives you a better understanding of the principle of, of where it works well and where it doesn't. Right? And people don't do enough of that anymore, I don't think. Mm, that's interesting. You know, when you talk about like, you know, the meta analysis and all that kind of stuff, like I think um, to me, like it seems like oftentimes people are, you know, like forget bol uh, balanced and positive, but there's a lot of people that are like, like there's almost another divide, which is like people that are super theory heavy and super that people that are the other side where they've done loads of practical training, but they, they aren't so familiar with the theory. Um, and it seems like there are a few people that have managed to marry both of them. And from everything I've heard about you, Michael, from watching your content and stuff like that, you seem to be someone that actually does, has has done that. You know, you had, understands the the theory side of things as well. What does, um, you know, was that something that you always did? Did you, are you someone that kind of like 
reads a lot of this stuff or, you know, I'm just curious, like, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's kind of the way my brain works. That's why I like, um, and, uh, so I have a lot of interest in ecology and ecological principles. I have a, my college degree was in biogeography, right? So I was assuming that I was going into kind of resource planning and environmental activism and all that kind of stuff is where my heart will lie. And I had a, a little bit of a kind of interest in biology and ecology and genetics and evolution and all of that stuff. And um, my favorite books are books written by um, kind of scientists, but written for the layperson. So there's a well-known author named David Quammen who writes books on biogeography. He wrote a book called Song of the Dodo and things like that. And he does a really incredible job of giving you science embedded in a story with practical, you know, sort of a little bit of uh, focus on the, the, um, the characters themselves, the scientists, their personality, their personal life, a little bit was happening historically at the time and very digestible science, but you got all the scientific principles. You knew all the principles of evolutionary biology when you were done with it, but in a really kind of, and that always appealed to me, like knowing why something worked just tickles me a little bit. Like, and you don't have to, to be a dog trainer. You could absolutely go like, I know mechanically what I need to do now to get what I want. I don't know, I have to know why it works, but it works, but that's not true for everybody. Some people can't commit to things unless they know why you get a, somebody that's a little analytical and you're trying to communicate with them and they're like, don't worry about it. Just do this. And they're, they can't really get on board until you can explain to them why. And I enjoy, I enjoy it when science kind of lines up with something you already know, like you've been, you've messed with something and you're like, I know this works. And then somebody goes, Oh, here's what's happening neurochemically. You're like, Oh, that's cool. I love that. <laughs> that's great. And I think it's, so it appeals to me. And then I think it also as a teacher, it's useful because you can speak to a wider range of people. I can speak to the person who said, I just don't worry about it. Here's the mechanics. Go ahead. We, you don't have to, over, don't overthink it. Just do it. Right. And then somebody who wants to know, you can speak to them well. So I think you have the opportunity to reach more people if you, if you kind of understand both sides of it. Yeah. Kind of a similar question, but like, you know, you speak there about teaching people as well. And I, again, that's something you're quite well known for. Is that something that you worked on as well? Or is that something that came quite naturally? I worked on it like crazy, meaning there was a shift in my mentality. So right, right when I first started doing seminars, I went out and you realized when I did that, people were going to ask me everything. And I wasn't really prepared. Like I knew how to do things, but I hadn't had somebody ask me about every little thing. Like, hey, when you present the tug, how are you holding it exactly? Or and I'm like, hold on a second. Like, yeah, I've had that feeling. Right? <laughs> right? Uh, give me a second. Let me go figure it because you just did it. You've done it so many times. You weren't even thinking about it. And so I'm like, huh. And I started to break things down into smaller pieces. And somewhere in there, I realized, oh, my job isn't a dog trainer. My job is a teacher and the subject is dog training. Right. And so I began to focus on whether or not people were, what I was saying was making sense to people. And Break. And my wife, before she went to grad school, had done a teaching credential. And so I grabbed her old lesson planning things and said, oh, this is how you plan lessons, because there's tons of information on good teaching strategies. And I borrowed some of the kind of core ones from that. And then everybody sort of develops their own style as you go. But I was very, very aware of the fact that teaching was my job. And I was, I began to be focused more on that, like, finding five different ways to say the same thing because you would look at a group of people. And one of the, when you said it, that we were talking a little bit at the beginning of teaching to a group of people versus standing in front of a camera and talking at the camera. So much of my talking about dog training has been done in a group of people in a class or in front of a seminar. So I'm so used to just making eye contact with a lot of different people and kind of reading the room and going like, okay, I said that. And I can see four faces in here that don't, understand what I just said. I can just tell me that didn't make sense to them. And so I was, I was, I was conscious of that the whole way along. And I began to collect ways of talking about these things that would reach a wider group of people. Right. So, and that has its own, own satisfying aspects to it. And once so, you realize that. 
like you kind of learned about dog training, so I imagine you probably read books and stuff like that on dog training and, and you know, behavior, learning be- behavior and all the rest of it. Did you do the same with teaching or was it more of like a uh, experimental thing? Like this works, this doesn't. More experimental. Like I, I have a fair amount of, I thought of the teacher. There was some, like I like I mentioned, I read um, some of my wife's teaching books on on lesson planning, for instance like setting up a lesson planning and there's a a common teaching principle and it's like tell people what you're going to tell them tell them and tell them what you told them (laughs) right (laughs) and so like i borrowed that right off the bat and i started doing it and at first it feels weird it feels like i'm saying the same thing three times i'm i'm prepping you to let you know and then i tell you what i'm going to tell you and then i tell you again at the end i'll recap and i'll repeat it and at first it felt really repetitive but i realized it works like a charm people don't get it on the first listen and so it's very frequently useful so there were those kinds of things that i pulled out of academia but then after that it was um me just sort of channeling the teachers that i liked uh, over the course of my academic career like people that really hit with me and I go, what, what did they do that made it resonate so much with me? And I started to try to think that way. And then you got to get out of your head too. Cause one of the things about teaching is, is it, it's best when it feels organic and natural. It doesn't feel good if somebody's up there with a PowerPoint and it feels like they're reading off the PowerPoint, you know, it feels good when somebody's talking to you. And because I started teaching, doing seminars, it was like, I'd talk a little bit and then we'd work dogs. And then I turn around and explain to some other people. So I didn't have to give a lesson lesson right off the bat, but I started to construct lessons there. And I learned a lot about teaching that way. I was traveling. There was a new group of people in front of me every week. As I traveled to do seminars, I learned all the different personality types. Like, oh, this I know this person, this the skeptical person or the person that's like, so nervous that they can't function in front of a group. And so I'm going to have to treat them differently. And so you, you, I got to experiment a lot there. I got to mess around a lot with teaching uh, uh, as as well before I, I actually opened the school. Can you give me an example of the, the use, that principle? That's going to be one that sticks in my head. Or the, the tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them again. Tell is them, it? Hold on. And then tell them what you told them. Tell them what you told them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know so about... Think- I'd come in and I'd go like, okay, today, today we're going to talk, this morning we're going to talk about classical conditioning, okay. right? And classical conditioning was discovered by Ivan Pavlov, da, 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 and I hit the main things. Yeah. I say, we're do that. And then I'd give a lecture on classical conditioning. I'd okay. break it all down into its little pieces. At the end, I'd go, okay, so today what we covered was this, 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 and this. Okay. These are the high points, these are the important things for you to remember. Yeah. And you just kind of go wreck, wreck through it. Yeah, I feel like I'm watching one of your DVDs now. <laughs> <laughs> But that's really calculated. And at first it felt unnatural, but if you do it enough, it doesn't at all. And people really appreciate it for something so simple. Like it really, they're like, yes, that helps me. Cause you sort of put their head in the right place before you hit them with the information. Uh, and then you hit them and then you make sure you review. And in that process, just make sure that you leave plenty of time for you, making an environment in which pe- people feel comfortable asking questions. Right. Mm-hmm. That's an important part of it. Like, cause somebody will let you gloss over something without understanding it. Cause they don't want to be embarrassed and say like, I didn't understand what you said in front of a group of people. So you either have to see that in them or create a, an environment in which, Hey, it's fine. Ask me anything. It's fine. You're not stupid. Somebody else has the same question and you got to keep that going. And by repeating it, some of the, you hit it enough time so that they don't have to ask the question. Sometimes you get through, but also then uh, the, I pause in there, like questions on that, questions on that. And then I have another opportunity to review it, questions, questions. And you just try to keep people connected that way. One of the rabbit holes I went down was magic. Like I really like watching magic. And they talk about when the, people do magic tricks, they talk about having a patter, like having like a, mm-hmm. like almost like a script. But I guess in my experiences of teaching has come about, like it's not something I've ever like written down what I'm going to say. It's just kind of like evolved naturally. But then if, if I'm doing a recall training with someone, for example, like I kind of, I have a script almost like without really me writing it. Like it just, I tend to explain things and it like almost word for word because I've done it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. When, when you do that though, 
one thing I'm conscious of is sometimes I think, hmm, am I a little bit on autopilot? Like, do I need to actually, like, I know this works, but maybe I need to force myself away from this, like, patter and try to explain it a different way. Because how do I know that this is the most efficient way to explain it? Do you, do you know what yeah. I mean? Do you, do you, uh -huh. do you find... Sorry, yeah, you look like you want to say. Oh, something. No, you're great. I'm just, <laughs> you're touching on really interesting stuff, right? Because of that, to me, that's fascinating. Uh, and, and you're right. It, and you have to say it a bunch of times for it to feel organic. I developed my wife as a as an actress and theater director, so she went to grad school in acting. So I was kind of aware of that whole world. And when I first started doing teaching stuff or doing videos and things like that, I thought, oh, I'm going to write a script. And then I'm going to memorize the script and then I'm going to do it. That's super hard to do. I have a complete respect for actors now, like to take material, memorize it, and then make it sound natural and organic and real is insanely hard. I couldn't do it at all. Right. So in order for it, you have to just say the things repeatedly until it becomes like second nature. You don't have to think about it too much. And that's when it starts to really feel natural. Like this information is just flowing out of this person. And then it's what you said. Then you said, I can get in a well-worn thing where I'm just saying the same thing every single time and it loses some of its life. And so I made a deliberate one. I was really attentive to watching people's faces. This is super important for me. Like I'm micro expressions on people's faces tell you what that, and they can, you can misread somebody, but if you're paying attention to the group that you're teaching to, you will see people that are confused. You will see people that are disinterested. You'll see all those kinds of things. And so I would glance around and I would use that as an opportunity to repeat what I just said a different way. And so then what winds up happening is, so this is the way I always say it. And I'm watching everybody's faces. I, I just tend to move around the room and make eye contact with people as I go around. Um, I find that helps keep them connected. And then also it, I can see if I feel like I'm losing somebody or in some fashion, um, and then you develop a whole bunch of different ways to say the same thing. And then you don't say exactly the same thing. You glance around and then you'll repeat it this way and another way. And the more you play with it, the easier it is like to just get up there and go like, I'm just going to extemporaneously talk about dog training and see where it goes. But that was only done after you had some well-worn grooves, right? I liken it to um, like learning music or something. You play a bunch of scales until you're good at it and then you can improvise and goof off, right? And teachings too, you have to say it re repeatedly until it comes out of you without you having to overthink it. And then you start playing with it. And it's important that you kind of, you, you do that. That's really interesting as a strategy and I'm definitely going to steal that because you almost get like a, What's that? That's an expression for that, isn't it? There's a second bite of the apple, or a second bite of the cake, or something like that. You get like a second. Yes. What is that expression? <laughs> I, you, you're right. There's an expression there. <laughs> I'm not remembering it right now. Oh, it I... doesn't matter anyway. But uh, so <laughs> it's one thing learning all this stuff yourself, but as you have obviously experienced, because you, you you have your own business, how do you then teach other people to teach? Like, have you have you developed a whole set of skills? for that that's funny that you mentioned that i'm i'm just starting to work on that more i like i was doing some of it with our long-term program students so we had for the last 13 years up until the, this last year i did the last one twice a year i did my long program and it started out it was four months or so when i started and then it was five months so i did two of those a year for 13 years and students would come and they'd be here for four or five months and i'd kind of run them through all the stuff and so embedded in there was me beginning to talk about like, Hey, you're dealing with a client, your jobs as a teacher. So pay attention to these little things, but I didn't really formalize it, um, much. I would just kind of plant seeds as we went along. Um, but recently the guys at dog trainers podcast, Brent Lovato and Mariano, uh, asked me if I would do a seminar on teaching actually. And so I'm, I'm a, in a couple of weeks, I'm actually doing one. So I've been giving it a lot more thought lately in trying to have an organized way. Cause I think it's something that um, lacking in the dog trainer education, Massively. like, and a lot of people are attracted to dog training because <clears throat> don't want to deal with the people like, yikes, that's bad, right? <laughs> Your job is the, the dogs are the easy part. The people are the hard part, right? That's the part where you need to expend your energy. And so, um, 
I'm, I'm giving giving a lot, a lot more thought about how to teach teaching because that, it, I, and I'm not as, I'm not as good at that as I am at teaching dog training. Cause I've obviously been talking about that for a lot longer, but I'm beginning to kind of put these ideas together in a way, in a kind of formal way to try to make, and I may wind up making a class on teaching. I think that's, I think that's a really good idea. Cause I agree. I think it's really like, like is there isn't a lot of information for dog trainers on that topic and it's something that i think most of us kind of have to just learn on our own and there's probably a lot of people that never learn it and you know <laughs> struggle with it you know forever and it, it, when i talk about this subject it reminds me of what you said earlier about when you first started doing dog training and people were asking you how do you hold the tug and you know you kind of had to like think about it for a second it feels like that for me when i try to talk about teaching people because there are so many things i do without uh really thinking about it and and i think also one thing i notice about this particularly is the more you concentrate on it like the more i think you're able to improve um which is just obviously a bit of a no-brainer really but um i think with teaching we as dog trainers and i'm not sure that a lot of people actually really think about it too much because, you know, I just don't think, I think it's, it's it's almost that mindset shift of what you said earlier, where it's like, oh, actually, I'm not really a, a I'm not really a dog trainer in this moment. I'm, I'm teaching dog training, you know, and, mm-hmm. and it's that mindset shift of actually, I'm, I'm, the skill I need to develop here is the teaching, <laughs> you okay. know, um, which I think a lot of people don't even really think about. That it, it was a, I hadn't, at the time that it hit me and um it was a a a sea change for me everything after that was different for me my my just the whole mindset of when i entered it was different right like i felt comfortable with you have to be comfortable with your subject of course right so you have to have mastery of your subject before you can teach it there are a lot of people out there teaching when they're still learning this is true in the dog training community a lot of people hang out a shingle uh with very little experience, right? When somebody just goes to dog training school for four months or five months and they get out and now they're, they're a professional dog trainer, right? And so there are a lot of people that are still learning on the job, as it were, that are teaching. And that's hard. That's really hard to do. I l- luckily did it as a hobby for a really long time before I took anybody's money, right? I had been dog training for 15 years before I ever took anybody's money for dog training. Right. And, and when I first did, I wasn't trying to be a professional dog trainer. I was like, Oh, look, I can make a little money on the side doing something I like. Right. And so I had played a lot with the ideas and the training enough. So I, you weren't thinking about that. One of the things that's hard for beginners to some degree is now you have two skill sets that aren't fully fleshed out. You're still learning about dog training. You haven't come at it from all these different angles. You haven't tried this technique on six different dogs, all that kind of stuff that that is you're going to have to collect through life experience and you're trying to teach it at the same time. So to me, I think about this a lot now because I'm trying to encourage young trainers to go slower in terms of building their business. Like think about mastering your subject and not getting ahead of yourself early on. And that feels like things are going more slowly, but it's, it's kind of built on some, it'll be a much more comfortable process for you. Right. And more successful in the end, you'll have more satisfied people because you'll be better at at that. You're not biting off more than you can chew. Yeah. It's a tough situation to be in because I mean, I've been there in the start of my career where, you know, I was just really obsessed with becoming like the best dog trainer I could be. And then, you know, you can't put uh, petrol in the, in the car, <laughs> you know, fuel <laughs> yeah. in the car, you would say, you know, but uh, yeah, well, that's essential. Like you have to be able to pay your bills. Like, I yeah. Get it. And then you, you know, and that's a hell of a stressor, you know, like that really is a horrible situation to be in. So you have a bit of a, like two competing things there is, is tough. One thing I think is really helpful. Like, I think a lot of people, when they're starting out, they feel like immense pressure to like take everything on or like they have to help everyone. And actually, yes. And I, I think the more, the, the kind of like irony is the people that are more experienced seem way more willing to actually just say, hey, this actually, this is not really my skill, this skill set, this just isn't really my jam, 
versus the people that are newer they're like oh, oh i i have to help them you know right oh yeah no it's so true so true and it's a, it's a total trap like it's bad news you see a lot of inexperienced trainers like we handle everything aggression cases like, like oh, you know separation they throw everything at you at once like and they say oh yeah we can do anything with your dog which is a, a crazy thing to say like i the longer i do it you're exactly right the longer i do it the less likely i am to say that the less sure i am about it's a cliche to say it too but the more you do it the less uh sure i am of what i know Right? Yeah, I recognize the complexity. Every time you say something, I'm like, well, yeah, that works. But here, sometimes, and then sometimes it doesn't. And, then like, and, and why and all that. And you, as you collect that stuff, you, you, you're you much more likely to make a nod to the, the complexity of the whole thing. Right? Yeah, that is a saying I remember. That's the, uh, that's all I know is that I know nothing, right? right. I remember that one. <laughs> Yep. and it builds on you and there's a a movie I, there's a movie i love it has nothing to do with dog training but uh there's a movie called my dinner with andre and uh, oh you should watch it it's the, so basically it's uh andre gregory who's a famous uh avant-garde theater director and wallace sean and wallace sean is the guy the inconceivable guy from princess bride he's yeah, that i love that film yeah yeah so wallace sean is also a huge intellect like he was a playwright and like nobody knows his plays they're super good. anyway so these two guys it's just them having dinner and the entire movie's their dinner conversation and andre gregory's talking about his teaching arc in life and theater and he's gotten to a point and he's like he's in his 50s and he's like i don't know anything anymore I can't teach anything anymore, right? And, and it's the, the, like, it's a reality. Like if you really dive deep into a subject and you spend a lifetime with that subject, there comes a point where you're like, this is so much bigger than I thought it was. And you know enough about the complexity of it that it becomes hard to be concrete. And when you're teaching dog training to somebody in the beginning, you can't get them with all the complexity. You have to make it sound like it's black and white. I have to give you simple black and white ideas. And then once you've mastered that, you get to go, oh, by the way, it's a little more complex than that. And then yeah. when they master it, oh, and by the way, that <laughs> yeah. doesn't always work either. And oh, by the way, right? And you do that for the rest of your life. But that that's a real thing where you hit the spot where you go like, hmm, I feel like I know less than I did. Because you're when you first start out, you learn a few things and you think, oh, I got this. You know, yeah. you're, you're telling everybody what you know and that whole thing, <laughs> that goes away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah the overconfidence the whole dunning kruger thing right but like, oh, man. um have, have, have we stumbled into another of your passions are you are you really into theater or like i uh, I, I do i love theater yeah yeah really? Interesting. yeah yeah so i goofed around so both my wife and i both did theater a little bit when we were in college she just done it forever and she's obsessed um but i did a little bit i was not good at it so uh, she was very good at it. And so my interest went another way, but I still, I still enjoy it. I, and art in general, right? So all the arts, one of my, I loved art history classes. And, I'm you know, curious was, because for me, you know, we spoke a little bit, we kind of like gone down a rabbit hole here with like a uh, you know, <laughs> hell of a rabbit hole, but like, um, for me, I don't know if you've ever had any moments like this, Michael, or like prolonged periods of time rather, but like, there was a time for me where I actually kind of lost my passion for dog training because I felt like I was working so much that it really just became like a job, you know, and I would get home and I would not train my dogs at all. I would not like engage in anything dog related. Um, and actually I found my passion again through getting my little working dog now and kind of being forced into training because she gives me no choice because <laughs> 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 otherwise she would just you know eat me and like uh and then i've like almost like re-found it and i've really enjoyed it and you know uh you know try to sort our business things out a little bit more to allow us more freedom so we're not just grinding constantly um but i think this is like a really common phenomenon in the dog training world where and actually from what i've seen from other like sectors any like i think it's a really common problem for people that do their job do their passion as their job oftentimes yeah. you lose the passion and it becomes the job which is like a really tight like uh tight rope to walk and i wondered if you've experienced that and or how you've avoided it 100 percent. it's you you hit it on the head 
like there's a trap and people say all the time, like, oh, you must be, you, it must be so great to do the thing that you love as your job. And it is like, it's true. Like it, there, there's something wonderful about that. There's also a trap in there and that you can poison the thing you love. Like no matter how much you love it, if you do it every day and that's all you do and you're driving a business, you have all these economic concerns that are connected to it that have nothing to do with the the job itself, then yeah, you can, everybody doesn't want to go to work someday. And so what I've found, my, my wife and I had this discussion because she did it with theater. She chose deliberately not to try to work professionally in theater because she can create the kind of theater she wants to create, right? So if she and friends get together and they rehearse something for three years and show it to 20 people kind of thing, right? They're like, right, so right. they can <laughs> dive as deep as they want. They can take the, uh, they the unpolluted, like no economic concerns. Nobody can, they can steer it in a different direction. That sounds no, a lot like an IGP competition. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. And so, but what I, what I found is one is you have to be cognizant of it and remind yourself and then rem make sure you make room to do other things like put other, when I said, like, make sure you cultivate some other interests so you can take a little mental vacation from it as well. And then the parts of it that really sparked your interest, make sure you make room for them. What tends to happen, like mine was through the world of sport dogs, right? And when the school, I opened the school and it got really busy the first five years of the school, I wasn't doing much. I mean, I was doing some of that as a part of the classes I was doing, but with my own dogs, like they were an afterthought. They got, they didn't get trained in nearly as much as I wanted. Like I would just bust them out and do some stuff with them, but it was bare minimum kind of thing. I didn't feel like I had the space and I started to feel bad about my job. There was a point in there. I'm like, why am I doing this? Like, this is killing me. And I just switched things around. Like you said, to the point where I made sure I made room for my personal time with my dogs that I moved that up the priority list. And that sort of changed things. It just kind of reminded me of why I got into it in the beginning. Right. Yeah, but I felt like I, I, I felt for me personally, I almost hadn't, I didn't really realize that I'd kind of burnt out until I kind of like found my way back out of it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> like yeah, it was kind, it's kind of a, a weird experience. But then getting back into it, I exactly what you said i'm kind of reminded of when i first got into dog training i was just a teenager and i was taking my dog out and training them all the time and stuff like that and actually hadn't done that for like years you know and i know for you um obviously you have your your other hobby because i know you're really into like racing birds and stuff right i i used to be very into ra racing homing pigeons um i've developed pigeon fancier's lung so i have uh you develop a some people develop a long-term sensitivity to the dander from their feathers so i, oh, I so i can't keep pigeons anymore oh, like you're I kidding me yeah. yeah wow i didn't know that was a thing that's that's a oh yeah that's, that's yeah, a yeah. really horrible thing isn't it <laughs> it's a horrible thing yeah and at first it was just like a little cough after you'd be in the loft for any of time but then it it got really bad by the end it manifests really slowly over a lot of years wow. and it gets worse and worse and i was wearing respirator masks and all this stuff but it got to the point where if i got any of the dander on me i'd get like flu-like symptoms and stuff wow, so now so you... sorry i, I don't keep it anymore no and it's totally fine i don't keep pigeons anymore but i have lot i have many other hobbies like birding i'm obsessive into birds in general so into birding i wander around and identify birds and hike around like a no, well, I'm but glad I'm... that we don't have an equivalent to that in the dog world because that would be terrible. Right? Yeah, <laughs> it would be terrible. Gradually get allergic to dogs. Yeah. So you were yeah. talking a little bit about your own dogs there. Did you have? Did you compete much? Like through um, over the years, have you have you done a lot of comp, comp, competing, or is it more being kind of like yeah. titling and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've I've done I've done more than my fair share. I have to add them up now, but. I think the my current dog is my third ring three dog that I've raised and trained from a uh, puppy. And then I've trained two to ring two and Schutzen three and a couple more to ring one. So at various times I've, I've pretty much had a competition dog at some going the whole time I've been training. Um, so like my dog Monk, who I just retired last year was 
is was a phenomenal dog and he uh, he paid the price of the starting the school i started him right about the same time we bought this facility that we're in now for the school and so he had big stretches where i didn't train him at all and that was like it i i trialed him at a couple of national events and things like that but he would have been a lot better he had two full years where i didn't train him hardly at all in there i was so busy well, i've heard good things about snook though snug snug's cool he's a monk <laughs> So he's, very, he's a cool guy we'll see what it, we'll see how we go but right now he feels really good <laughs> yeah, yeah. one thing i thought was really interesting when i started looking into your breeding program michael was the whole cross training thing because it seems like uh I've, I've not really read a lot about that like i think a lot of people are really like focused on one sport and then um and then i was reading about lisa Mazer's dog uh feist yes Getting, mm -hmm. getting IPO free, uh, French ring free, Mondio free. Yep. That's, that's unbelievable. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. Who's a special dog. We've had several of our dogs that we bred that have done that. There was another one from, uh, Feist's sister. I had Votoi, one of her sons, Jersey was French ring three, Mondio ring three. And really? uh, yeah. Yeah. Do, do you not, do you, that, I mean, that's gotta be a hell of a challenge. It is. You know, don't you yeah. do you find that uh those things kind of like hurt each other you know like like it causes some confusion yes yeah so in order to carry it off successfully you need a good dog and you need to know all the sports so you kind of recognize the places where they conflict to minimize the conflict between them and then you are going to get beat by the specialists in each of those sports right so you may be do a good job. You may even be competitive, but you're not the, like you're going to, there's a few points here and there uh, that you're giving up because of the fact that you've cross-trained, you've introduced those elements. Um, and, but to me, part of it is the, uh, it started out just because uh, Schutzen was my first experience with, with um, bite sports. And that was what was available. And it's certainly the most available. And the fact that ring sport kind of landed here. So we were goofing around with ring sport, cross training a little bit with our shits and dogs, because I wanted to learn how to do soup work. And I wanted to kind of understand that. So we were Lisa and I and, and people were all cross training a lot just to try to figure out because we were just curious, right at, at that spot. And I'm not um, I compete basically to see what my training is doing. Like I'm not a super competitive person in that, in that, like there are people out there that go and winning is the deal for them. Right. I don't, re I mean, I, I want to win every, every competition I enter, I would, I would like to win, but it's not a driving force for me. I feel like competition for me is what you do after you put in all that time. I'm a process guy. I love the training part of it. I like all the that stuff. And then you hit a certain point, you want to see if it worked, right? You got to check it out, but I'm not as driven by like, oh, I have to win the national championships and because, and I've never had that. And so from the beginning, um, I was willing to experiment even with my competition dog, right? Like, huh, what if I do a bunch of suit work with my Schutzen dog? Is that going to be good or bad? Right? What if I, what, you know, uh, what if I defer teaching barking until my dog's way older? Cause that's good for my ring dog. What's that? Can get? And so I just goofed around with a lot of that stuff the same way. Yeah. That's and really interesting. Did you know beginning people don't do too much of it in the beginning for a lot of, a lot of people, if you're learning a new sport, I recommend people don't cross train a whole bunch while you're learning it. Once you basically know the progression for a sport, then goof with it, but you'll really confuse your dog if you don't have, an idea of where the conflicts lie do you find that the dogs are capable of doing you know if you if you breed a good working dog they're pretty capable of doing any of the sports that you think that you you really need to have like a dog that is really specially bred for the one sport no i think uh i think a good, good, good a good dog's a good dog right so the the first class dogs i call them could do anything right for sure there are subtle differences between the disciplines, which gives a certain dog an advantage over another dog. So if your whole goal is to win the French ring championships, then you're better off looking at French ring specific bloodlines because the little small things that make the tiny details 
are more likely to be there in those dogs. Same with IGP, right? Uh, this the, uh, Imondio ring, for instance, or Belgian ring, a dog that is more internal in their energy manifestations, right, is an easier dog to train. A dog that doesn't externalize a whole bunch, they burn up a lot of unnecessary energy. There are long exercises with unpredictable durations, like the object guard, the defensive handler, and things like that. So a really kind of cranked external dog has a harder time. And so you want a dog that kind of internalizes their energy. They can kind of wait calmly. And a lot of those dogs can look sort of flat sometimes. So if I take that temperament or that wiring or that temperament type dog and try to do modern IGP obedience, for instance, it's a lot more work. You want a dog that's like, because then they show all this really flashy animated externalized obedience that the IGP world likes. So that that wouldn't stop you from getting titled, but it would stop you from winning the worlds or that kind of thing potentially, or give yourself a lot more work in a certain area. What differences do you notice in the like helper work for the for the sports, and which do you prefer as well? Do you do you prefer putting on the the bite suit or the sleeve? <laughs> oh, I, I definitely pr prefer putting on the suit. The suit's a lot more fun, right? It's it feels more. You can move more naturally. It's less rigid and predictable. Like so, one of the things about IGP helper work, um, which is fun too. It's all fun. It's all cool. And it each of them has their own kinds of difficulties. Um, but in IGP work, your job is to kind of show every dog exactly the same to the judge as much as possible, right? So your work should be very predictable, very patterned, and it's a very predictable style of pressure. And it's not that a decoy doesn't have their own little style things, but you're pretty much in that 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 world, you're trying to make it as consistent as possible. In ring, then the decoy has a lot more leeway to move differently, to kind of exploit things they're seeing with different dogs. It feels a little more loose and free. So I enjoy that. And also the suit work, you you it feels more intimate with the dog in a sense, right? You feel it. You know, you know when a dog's really biting you because it hurts, right? And those kinds of things. And, and so there's a, a a connection there. So I'm definitely a fan of of the suit sports for sure. Also, I'm a fan of the suit sports because I think the the Malinois is what it is because it's come it's been developed primarily through the suit sports. There's what? distinct breed differences between the German breeds that have used IGP strictly as their breed test and the Dutch, Belgian, and French programs that have primarily made the, the Malinois. Cool. I'm glad you brought that up because I'm really curious as to what you... Maybe like... And I know this is a really hard thing for you to do, Michael, but like, could you, could you kind of explain maybe a little bit about the differences between the breeds that get used most frequently? Uh, because... Like, for example, you know, we think about like Malinois, Dutch Shepherds, Rottweilers, Dobermans, German Shepherds, like are there tendencies you tend to see in those dogs? Like for sure. A, a little explanation. Yeah. So the way I conceptualize it is the German heritage breeds who have you for the last hundred plus years have used Schutzend as their breed suitability test and then subgroups of primarily the Malinois or Malinois and Dutch Shepherd, which I consider the same breed, right? Uh, Malinois and Dutch Shepherds are basically the same, uh, uh, but different the, different than the French and Belgian dogs, right? So in Holland, the KNPV, the unregistered KNPV dogs, the Malinois and the Dutch Shepherds are very similar creatures, right? And one's got stripes and whatnot. They actually breed them together all the time. And if they so come out... You wouldn't say there's any differences between those two breeds. No. Yeah. They're very similar. Right. And now we're not talking like uh, FCI reg registered Dutch Shepherds. We're talking about the KNPV unregistered dogs in Holland. Right. And it's because they'll all the time, they'll breed a Dutch Shepherd and a Malinois together. And the ones that come out that have stripes get called a Dutch Shepherd. And the ones that come out fawn or red get called. Malinois, they they do it constantly, right? So, and if you look behind them, a lot of them go back to the similar dogs, right? So you go back in the Dutch Shepherd bloodlines, and you'll see a bunch of Malinois back in there. You go back in the Malinois, ones, and you'll see a Dutch Shepherd mixed in there. So they're the unregistered lines are very similar, right? And so if there are differences, they're not meaningful differences in in training and things like that. So 
and then so we have all the German breeds: Dobermans, Rottweilers, Giant Schnauzers. There's got to be differences breeds. between them, though, right? The the German ones, like uh... yeah, there, there there are personality differences between all of them. But like when I kind of talk conceptualizing how they do protection work, and what training systems they respond to, mm -hmm. and what a good one looks like, right? Like a Rottweiler is obviously different than a German Shepherd, right? Their energetics are different than one big dog. Like most Rottweilers traditionally didn't have as much prey drive as a lot of German Shepherds did. They came to the work a little more confrontationally. There's things like that, right? But the methodologies for training them were all very similar. All the stuff that you would see in an IGP club, you know, they get a lot of barking, they threaten the dog, they want the dog to channel from defense to prey all the traditional stuff there. They want the dog, uh, they're going to reinforce the dog by letting them have equipment, by slipping equipment to them as a way of letting them win, et cetera. Um, and so that's a, to me, that's one of the, that's the root of one of the big differences between the German heritage breeds and the Malinois is the German heritage breeds were raised on a system in which they can be given the equipment at any given time. You have a, a IGP three dog, and you still slip a sleeve to them, right? There's a pro, it's an external piece of equipment that can be given up to the dog at any time, right? And in the suit sports, that's not the case. As soon as your dog's on the bite suit, they no longer win the equipment. They have to be under control. They have to let go when I ask them to let go, and uh, and they're never given the equipment again, right? So from the time they're seven, eight, nine months old, or whenever they go on the suit. That's the end of it, right? So they have to get a lot of satisfaction from biting for its own sake. All the satisfaction has to happen here. I can take a dog in IGP, and the best IGP dogs still get satisfaction biting, right? In that same way, but I can take and develop a dog where if you fight hard enough, I let you win and you can possess the equipment. So you can have a dog that can feel, that can be taught to bite to win the equipment, that if you had to make them bite and out and bite and out and bite and out and bite and out, they wouldn't look so good anymore. They would begin to be lessened or, or, or brought down by that. And so the, I think that the German breeds with that, they have the, a kind of way of conceptualizing what a good dog is. They want the dog to have um, a certain kind of character. They want the dog to manifest aggression when threatened and then be able to channel into prey. They're looking at a certain gripping style specifically and it's always done on equipment that's given to the dog at some point or can be given to a dog as it goes through and it's patterned extremely patterned right same same art so it's not about the difficulty of the exercises it's about doing them perfectly at that spot then you go the other into the ring sports and they're all subtle and different french ring and belgian ring have more similarities than they do with the dutch program with the KNPB program which is meant to make police dogs but all those dogs are suit dogs and they have to go on to the suit, right? And they have to be put under control. The elements of control and bite work are significantly higher in those sports, meaning dogs are outing off of, in French ring, certainly in Belgian ring, the decoy is actively moving right up to the point where you out them. So they're not stopping and freezing before you out the dogs, all that. So there's an emphasis on a lot of a dog to get a lot of satisfaction from biting for its own sake. And they support control really well because they have to be put under a lot more control. And then you add the element, certainly in, in Belgian ring and French ring and Mondia ring, you add the element of uh, unpredictability and that they're less patterned, right? Things are gonna change. Exercises aren't always gonna look the same. The order of the exercises is gonna be different. The style of the decoy work can be radically different. You can have a decoy that's really hard with a stick and other guy that's really quick, like very, very different styles. And the dogs have to adapt to all of those things. So a different kind of dog comes out of that. That's why I think the Malinois is different than all the other breeds are. And the limiting factor, I think, in the suit sports and why you don't see as many of the German breeds do as well in suit sports is because they haven't been selected for it. People go like, oh, you don't see as many German Shepherds in, in ring sport. They're there, but you don't see as many because um, they can't do the jumps or whatever. They're they're not. That's not it, in my opinion. It's finding one that bites and outs and bites and outs, supports all that control and enjoys biting for its own sake. That's the bigger limiting factor. They exist, but people don't pay much attention to them in the German Shepherd world. Right? Oh, that's you, so fascinating. That's really interesting. So, with the like ring sports mallies, does that mean that you have dogs that are like less? driven by possessing the item yeah oh yeah lots of them 
Yeah. Some of them don't care at all. It was a big issue when we first started. And there are there are them there are Malinois that do certainly, but when we first got Malinois, we tried to train them like German shepherds. So back to that early day when I discovered our first Malinois, and my friend came back from Belgium, we traditionally put a, tied them out on a pole, did a cracked a whip, got them barking like crazy, boom boom, good aggressive barking, give them a bite on a sleeve, and then slip the sleeve to them, let them carry it around. Malinois hated that shit. Oh my god. Like they were just like, ah, they get way overstimulated. They bite. And then as soon as they bit, you let them have the equipment and the fight stopped. And they're like, it's like a punishment. It's like a, punishment. Oh, it's like a punishment. Exactly. Right. As opposed in that. And at the time I was like, gosh, that like, how come our dogs, which are the same bloodlines as these dogs we bought had bought older dogs for police and things like that. And they bit like crazy. And I'm like, how come ours don't bite like that? How come ours are all manky and making all kinds of noise and they're thrashing and all this. And, uh, I went to Belgium and I watched the Belgian ring guys work their puppies, their adolescent dogs. And it was super calm, like very little stimulation. The puppy would bite and then they do the puppy would bite for like 30 seconds or 45 seconds. And then they just let it carry the thing around. Right. So I'm like, oh, we're not working dogs like that at all. And so we totally shifted gears because the satisfaction came in the biting. So if you really frustrated them a lot and gave them a bite and then didn't let them stay in there and satisfy on the bite they got more and more hectic. Right? And so, and you didn't need to stimulate them that much. Like a lot of, especially the Belgian bloodlines in Belgian ring, the decoys are quite passive, right? They judge static gripping a lot in Belgian ring. They want the dog always pushing in on the bite, right? In Belgian ring, they think a dog that pulls back is afraid. It's avoiding the decoy, right? This idea that if it's pulling, it's trying to get away from the decoy. It's not always the case, of course, but that's what the, that's the culture. And so a decoy would be pretty still and the dogs have to go through all this crazy stuff and bite a decoy and he'd just stand there, just barely moving the dog. So they got dogs that bit well without a lot of activity and stuff like that. And they bit statically on somebody that wasn't moving very much. So this was the satisfaction for them. Right? And so as soon as we started switching to training our, I, we were still doing IGP, but we started to work the young dogs more like that, even though we were, they did, they were way more successful. They bit better, that whole thing. So those are the kinds of like cultural differences between the dogs. Like a good German shepherd responds really well to that. Fire them up, get them crazy, barking, bite, slip, carry that whole paradigm. And what's happened now in Germany it, with, when the Malinois got popular in Germany, which happened in starting in the late eighties, Right before that, you saw very few Malinois. Late '80s, early '90s, the Malinois caught on in Germany as well, and the DMC, the German Malinois Club, was formed early on. And Edgar Schirkel and um, Peter Schirk and all those guys that got together and starting the DMC in Germany. And now the the Malinois in Germany uh, is a little more German Jeopardy. They've selected wow. them. they've selected them for. IGP specifically right. and the training methods around that. So those dogs become a little bit more like German shepherds in that sense. And then you can begin to see differences between the German IG, popular IGP bloodlines and certainly the bloodlines coming out of Belgium, France, or Holland. There's some differences there for sure. Yeah. It was one of the things that struck me. Like I said, I'm a newbie to this world, but I got my first IGP line dog recently from Germany and it was one of the things that struck me when I would play with her the first thing she wants to do if she gets the toy is go find a little space you know to go sit down with the toy you know sure. um, which is exactly what you're talking about with the possession and stuff like that um, so yeah. that's just really I think it's so cool to see the genetics so cool I'm really curious though what you what do you think um, what program do you think is the best selection for police dogs the, the KNPV, uh, the Dutch program, is probably the best for the modern police dog, right? Because that's all they care about. Like they strongly test the stuff that you need. They don't that it doesn't they don't have very much control on the dogs in comparison to the ring sports. Um, but that's not necessary in law enforcement. They don't have the same levels of control once the dogs are on the street. And they're looking at the things primarily that make a good police dog which is a dog that's very environmentally sound, a dog that searches a lot. They have lots of searching exercises, search for a decoy, search for a wooden box in the woods, search for small metal articles and retrieve those, right? So they emphasize all the stuff that 
and their whole goal is to make working police dogs, right? They want to make sure the dogs have aggression. They want to make sure that the dogs bite somebody that's still all that kind of stuff. And so that program probably turns out the most protection dogs. I mean, the most police type dogs, the, the Belgian program, Belgian ring is my favorite in terms of testing all the things that make a good working dog, right? The, they test gripping, they test control ability, they test athletic ability through jumping, they test the dog's ability to handle environmental stressors that change repeatedly, and they uh, focus a lot on the dog's ability to generalize. Like So they have exercises like the object guard in which the dog has to work independently of the handler. And they have two object guards. They have one with a decoy and a suit, and they have another one in which somebody's in civilian clothes and the dog's wearing a muzzle. So they also want aggression. So they want good gripping behavior, aggression, athletic ability. So to me, the Belgian program is the perfect program for dog, for making dogs that could be successful at any different, at any discipline. And still in the Dutch breed to Belgian dogs, the French breed to Belgian dogs. Like when somebody wants to add something, they go find an NBBK dog from Belgium and that's behind. And it's not on a lot of the ped pedigrees. There's a lot of fake pedigrees in Malinois, right? Because a lot of the KNP dogs weren't registered with the FCI and neither were the NBBK dogs. And so, but they are been highly influential on the breed. But the Dutch program is the one that's making the most police dogs by far. Yeah, I went down a bit of a scent work rabbit hole over the last year, and all of the kind of scent work trainers I was speaking to were saying KMPV is, you know, is the place if you really want a, a very good scent detection dog. And it seems like uh, maybe some of the other programs seem to select less for that. Or Though I did notice when I was listening to Ivan's podcast about American Schutzhund, it sounds like they're kind of trying to rectify that a little bit by starting to add some scent work exercises and and stuff like that do you think that that's something that programs should look at or do you think actually now now as a sport you know we're enjoying it for the sport's sake and you know uh, so uh, wearing my my sport hat i think it doesn't matter very much wearing my breeder hat i think it matters right so you can lose stuff in bloodlines quickly if you're not checking for it right and so um like I do kind of above and beyond search stuff with my dogs that I'm going to breed. So Would I want to not select a dog. If say you had a dog that was a great IGP dog, but actually didn't have much search drive. Would you not select that dog? I would not select that dog for as a breeding dog for me. Right. So everybody has a different thing, but like I'm looking for a specific kind of dog and there's certain things that I don't want to compromise on jumping, gripping behavior, of a certain kind and then uh there's aspects of the dog's mental kind of ability to hold training and be consistent etc but and the other is is search drive because like... i don't know mondio very well but it seems like from my limited experience in these sports it seems like i i think mondio and i think igp you don't sure you have tracking in igp but you don't really have the same kind of selection that you might have in the kmpv program for like making sure yeah. you have a really good Yep. capable dog for scent detection. Yep. Yeah, the two scent, scent places in Mondio Ring are going to be the search for the decoy, which can be a challenging search depending on the size of the field and things like that. So it's nice to have a good searching dog when you're teaching that. In modern French Ring, the search is a purely done as a pattern anymore. Those dogs, it's a free search technically. You bring the dog on the field, you send them to search, but everybody just teaches the dog to run the perimeter. And the dogs just look for the guy in the blinds as it goes around the circle. Mondio ring has a more realistic search. So it has a little bit more emphasis on the dogs really using their nose to hunt for the decoy, right? Um, but it's in a finite space and that kind of stuff. So it's not a super hard search, but it's more than the other sports are in that sense. And then it has a scent discrimination exercise, which is an obedience exercise, which is not a complicated scent, scent exercise. So that it could have more of that kind of thing for sure. Right. Um, uh, but it, it does a little better job than than some of the other disciplines in terms of teaching the dog, looking for a searching dog, not as much as the KNPV, but more than uh, more than the French ring dog, certainly. And even the IGP and the bite work, there's no searching in the bite work right, to speak of. Yeah, I find it interesting as well. Like we were talking a little bit about different breeds earlier, like Dobermans, Rottweilers, that kind of stuff. It seems like their popularity isn't in the sports is not. Uh 
massive and it's like it's a shame because i really love those breeds and mm -hmm. also they i think maybe a, a part of the issue with the popularity is the health you know and and that's a shame as well um uh so it's 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 a tough situation uh for those breeds like i i don't know like uh i don't know how into this you are but like for me i'm really interested in like breeding healthy dogs as well and quite into um outcrossing and stuff like that which seems so desperately needed in especially dobermans i think could probably absolutely in dobermans or it so go ahead and you finish your thought now i mean with dobermans i think when you actually yeah. uh go down the rabbit hole of listening to geneticists and stuff like that it's like i mean there's no way back without without outcrossing I, the dogs um I, and I, and I think the the Rottweilers have a similar <clears> issue <throat> with osteosarcoma, the bone cancer, and stuff like that. You know, it, it seems like they're also on the kind of downward turn. Yep. The issue was, of course, the selection, right? So you can inbreed all you want if you are ruthless with your selection. And that's where it goes down the tubes for people, right? And so Dobermans and Rottweilers got really popular and they got popular based on what they look like, right? And they were not, they, they were working lines, but still they had to meet all the other breed standards, stuff like that. And so what wound up happening is increasingly the Doberman population couldn't work or the Rottweiler population couldn't work because people were selecting them specifically. And the ones that did work was a smaller and smaller gene pool. <clears throat> and because there weren't enough of them, they weren't selective enough. They didn't say like, oh, no, this dog has to be eliminated. It has this health issue. It's like, we got a phenomenal working one finally, but it's got, you know, it's going to die when it's seven or whatever the heck it is, or it's got wobblers or it's got something right in those things. And, but they weren't selective enough at the time. And so now they've painted themselves into a corner. One of the things about the Malinois is they've always had distinct gene pools in different areas they got the dutch dogs they got the french dogs they got the belgian dogs like the, so there was places to go and then they would definitely inbreed but the traditions around the inbreeding in in belgian in the belgian dogs especially was that they were ruthless those guys were crazy about their selection right and there's there there's there's a really interesting book called uh snake foot which is written by a guy that bred English pointers, right? And he was the most famous American breeder of English pointers. His kennel was L. Hugh Kennels. And you, if you look back in hunting, modern hunting English pointers, you can't go back there without finding L. Hugh dogs back there. You, you know. And he inbred like crazy, but of course he, he was willing to euthanize anything that wasn't perfect. Like if it had any L stuff, it wasn't right, it's out. And after a certain period of time, then there's nothing bad left in there. Right. And, but that most people don't do that. And the unfortunate part about breeding tight is you have to be very strict about the selection. And now once they've missed the boat, they're too late. They got to get something else in there to get the bad stuff out. One thing that's interesting about Malinois though, is obviously you have the KMPV lines you were talking about earlier and in the KMPV, they seem far more relaxed about oh. crossing. And, and I think mm -hmm. that's almost like a, that's, that's, I think that's a really good thing because you're you're constantly having a source of outcrossing, bringing new genetics in, and you, yep. you don't have the same issues that, like almost any other breed is going to have because you don't uh, because in in all the other breeds we have such a purity mindset where like you have to have hundred percent of of whatever breed and actually when you go through the history it's really interesting because that's actually like far more recent than people realize is to, oh, to yeah. be so purist about about it. And um, outcrossing used to just be normal. Like you just used to do that sometimes. Yeah. Um, but I, I think one of the issues that you get when you when you do a lot of inbreeding is sometimes you have the recessive genes that you just don't even know are there, right? And, until you start doing the inbreeding, and then also obviously, you know, it, I, I'm not an expert in this by any means, but my understanding is when you have dogs that start having higher percentages of inbreeding, you also are going to start getting higher risks of cancers and stuff like that which can be quite problematic. Yeah, it, it, and it all comes down to the selection in the same fashion, right? So if you're one of the, before genetic testing, one of the ways that they eliminated 
negative recessives was they would inbreed and the dogs that manifested it could get removed from the gene pool. That's so brutal, right? <laughs> and, and the ones that didn't, didn't have it, right? So if you do that enough times, right? So you can say Darwin's finches on the Galapagos, right? So there's these finches that went on an island. There's no new genetic material. They've been for a hundred thousand years, a million years, two million years, right? So they're obviously intensely inbred. There's not any new genetic material coming in, but they don't have health problems. They don't have anything because everything died. Everything that wasn't <laughs> that wasn't okay doesn't make it right. Yeah. And so, so it's all about the selectivity of that. And so, uh, and the, here's the the argument for inbreeding at a certain point. One, you have to make sure you keep the larger gene pool open. You need to have places to go. You need that, right? But inbreeding gives you consistency. If you outcross all the time, you don't. You're not going to have any clue what you're going to get. Oh, 100 percent. Sure. All eight, all eight puppies in a litter will be different. You make the breeding one time, you, the next time it's different completely. And so some inbreeding is necessary for consistency sake. And then if you're not willing to be very rigorous about your your uh, selection, then you should outcross more frequently. That I way think, you keep that I stuff. Think so many times now the breed, so many breeds are so inbred. <laughs> There really isn't a lot of genetic difference between individuals, regardless of whether they're related or not. Because, you know, once you actually go back, you know, where they, I, I mean, it sounds like you might know more about this than me, but like the effective breeding population, you know, is oh, tiny. Yeah. Like you start tiny. reading about that and like Back some of these breeds, yeah, yeah. like some of these breeds are like basically single digits, you know, and it's yeah. like, you, you, yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah. The whole rabbit hole. I'm and, curious. Sorry, that could all ahead. that could all be fixed if they would get away from the idea of the purebred dog uh, and, yeah. and manifestations of its necessity for competition, right? So the, a lot of the working dog registries used to have registration on merit. Even border collies used to have this. The the working border collie association before they were adopted by the kennel clubs and stuff like that. If you, you could register the dog as a border collie, if it herded like a border collie, they didn't care what it looked like. They didn't care. Like, so if somebody showed up one day with a Kelpie that herded like a border collie, it, they could, they could register it and it could get bred to other border collies in their, in their thing. And what winds up happening is once you have a, like the FCI and all those organizations, they're saying like, they want, it's a money-making scheme. Like your dog has to be registered as a pure of this with us in order to compete. And so now that emphasis on, on purebred registration. And the, one of the reasons that the Malinois is as good as it is, as healthy as it is in general, is the fact that the, the, the guys didn't care. They bred to the best dogs and they didn't care if they were registered or not. The guys in Holland, the guys in Belgium, they didn't care. And they, the old timers are like, how would I pay somebody to tell me what my dogs are? They know what, I know what they are. I know what they are for the last 10 generations. I don't like, I don't have to give you money to keep my records for me, but that's a problem now. So, so people have to go, if you like, if they're going to fix the Doberman, they're going to have to go outside the breed at this stage. And that means they'd have to either fake it or get permission, right? To yeah. Do well, I, I'm maybe not anything as extreme as that but a lot of kennel clubs do have programs now for phenotyping you know where you can you can kind of do what you said there like where you can say hey my dog looks like a doberman um and passes these tests and you can kind of get permission to have papers on those dogs but like you know it's not many people know about it and it's still really taboo <laughs> so, yeah <laughs> you, know, you know so it's a weird is, thing right yeah so I'm, I'm curious so like more recently um you know you go on social media and it seems like there's a million malinois in rescue or like that every all the time you know people have malinois that probably shouldn't have malinois um does that ever bother you or do, do you does that come into do you think about that when you're breeding dogs for example does that kind of like make you feel a bit crap about it sometimes yeah it sucks it's the like it bothers me immensely right the, when i started in malinois the only people that had them were working people that were relatively serious about that either police or sport working people you never saw them in a shelter like if you saw another Malinois, you're like hey another malinois whoa yeah, what the hell probably. right and so and if one showed up in a shelter 
the 10 local Malinois people would all be there like, oh, what hell the hell did a Malinois get in the shelter, right? So that was, it was a non-issue. And now they're, they're popular for all the wrong reasons with people that are not doing the research necessary to really, and people buying them and thinking like, ooh, I'm going to make police dogs and sell them. And they realize that they can't. And so they breed entire litters and can't sell them and wind up dumping them in the shelters and no, but people breeding without strict criteria, the whole nine yards, it's awful. And so shelters are full of them. Rescues here in the States are full of them. They're everywhere. It sucks. And I've slowed way down in my personal breeding because of that. Like, like I, I've bred, I don't know, probably 65 litters of Malinois in, in my career. Right? And then they'll let, now I only make a litter when I have a bunch of friends that want dogs. Right. It's like, okay, I have five friends that want dogs. I want a dog for me or something. Well, I'll do a litter because it's, it's harder and harder to find good homes for them. I can't imagine it is for you everywhere. Surely. Well, it, it is, it is to, to some degree because there, there's way more options for people. Right. And then, um, and then people will go, go, Hey, I can go try to grab a dog out of rescue or whatever that's going to be too. And so, and also I think that's part of that's a shift in cultural stuff. Right. There's a cultural shift in how people feel about uh, working dogs uh, that if the dog doesn't fit their lifestyle, that they get it, they think, oh, I want to work, I want a protection sport dog. And they get it. And then they, the dog's got aggression or something like that. And they're like, oh, I didn't want that. Right. I wanted one of those biting Labradors, right? That goes out there, <laughs> but isn't isn't really going to bite people. It's not going to bite my friends and stuff like that. And that's, that's always a risk when you deal with Malinois are bred to bite stuff, right? They're they like, they get lumped in the herding breed here, but they're not herding dogs. They're police dogs, right? They have been for the last 120, 125 years or so police dogs. And so even if I breed two nice ones, they're not necessarily all going to be nice. And so people don't have the same level of dedication to the dog. Uh, and that that I used to, used to see, they were kind of people were a little more like committed in the past. Now people are like, "Ooh, that looks fun! I'm going to try that. I want to get one of those dogs." And you're like, "Uh," <laughs> yeah, so totally. it's depressing, actually. I have a question I have to ask for my friend Cat, and I feel like I'm going to butcher it because it's not it's kind of her thing, you know, and I'm I'm not going to do it justice. But she really wanted me to ask you if you think dogs can have if there, or if there's such a thing as like innate work ethic, and she actually differentiates that from drive, she thinks of it as something different. And I'm I'm curious if if that kind of like resonates with you. Yes. <laughs> the short answer is yes. No, no, the, 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 absolutely. Um, so when I was talking before about um, some of the things in breeding that I think are that I, that I don't want to compromise on as a, as a breeder of Malinois, right. Um, gripping, jumping, searching, there's some basic kind of drive related stuff there and the style with which the dog uses their mouth, which are all very genetic, but also for me, when I said some stuff about the dog's brain, <laughs> about how they think it, when it's like how they retain training, um, how regular they are once they're trained. Right. So there are dogs that have a lot of drive that are, that are, that you're kind of constantly trying to keep them under control all the time. And it's not like you hit a point in the training where you're finished, finished. Right. And for me, I like a dog that once they understand a skill, they're up to a spot that, um, they'll, that they'll do that repeatedly and consistently and embedded in all of that. And then that they retain training well. Um, uh, if you don't train for a bit and you come back, how do they retain training? Do they act like they've forgotten everything or are they right there, they back into it. And then the dogs that seem to enjoy the work for its own sake, there's the, I think that's what it gets to when it's a work ethic. Yes, we use rewards or things to teach the behaviors initially, but then there are dogs that just seem to thrive on the act, the act of working. And the whole thing, it, it's not, there, there's a point where they don't, they're not really seeking reward in the same way. The activity, the work itself is reinforcing for those dogs. And those are dogs to say would have a good work ethic. And that's absolutely 
genetic and we do things to develop it and help it. Right. So good trainers get that more often and that because they set up the circumstances in which the dogs can develop some part of it, but there's absolutely a genetic component to it. I think Kat's going to enjoy that answer very much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious because if you ever, I, one question I always like, I always like to ask people, um, and we can get to this in a minute, but like, you know, who they rate as being like, you know, like in sports, for example, you have the goat, don't you? you have the greatest of all time. Like who is, who's your top five? Who's your like Mount Rushmore of dog trainers, for example. And your name comes up time and time again. People are always putting you in that uh, category. So I'm curious, how did you get so good, essentially? How did you get so good, Michael? Because there's a lot of people that, you know, it's not just, it's clearly not just time. Like, you know, there's a lot of people that have been training for as long as you and aren't as skilled as you. What did you do different? Gosh, what I, I would probably dispute the fact that I should be on the list of the things. There are, are a lot of really, really talented trainers out there that that are super gifted. Um, I think my reputation, is, I, I can I can train a dog, but I think my reputation is a little bit more in how I've been able to convey the ideas to other people to some degree, and then. Um, I've been very dedicated to a, a, a style of training that I think is for the dog ultimately. And I think that resonates with people. And so, and I've been effective enough and successful enough at that and trained dogs to do it. So that, that I think that that resonates with people to some degree, the idea that, um, you can have a really well-trained dog and have done it in a humane kind of, uh, thoughtful way. Um, and then I, I put some energy into like helping teach people to do it. Right. Uh, and I, if anything, I'm, I, I'm good at conveying some of those ideas to people in a way that makes sense to them, I think. Right. But I, I don't, I don't know that I should be on the Mount Rushmore of dog trainers. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I want to, I, I want to know the nitty gritty though. Like, is there anything, uh, you know, is there something that you think, you do that maybe other people neglect when it comes to like i i'm, I'm kind of putting teaching aside for now because like a, i think that's kind of a different skill set like when we're talking about dog training is there something okay. that that you've done that maybe other people neglect i don't know what, what that is i think a, a couple of things in the development of my my training at this point is one i didn't put any pressure on myself uh timeline wise or any of that kind of thing there were, I mean, there were spots where I was training a pet dog and you said, Oh, I have four weeks to put the, get this dog to do it. But in general with my own dogs and my own development of dog training, um, I was willing to experiment a bunch and I didn't put any kind of timelines on it at all. And I was willing at a certain stage to work with the dog that was in front of me, like in the working dog circles, a lot of times, um, if a dog isn't uh, like a first class specimen, people aren't going to spend any, they'll, they'll wash it. Right. And, um, it's not like I haven't had dogs that I didn't keep, but the, I, I've done it with a lot of dogs and I've worked some marginal dogs in training too. And I, and as a decoy, I've worked lots of marginal dogs and helped them be successful. So I think part of it is that there's developing techniques that work with a wider variety of dogs and being flexible and not feeling like there's one way to do it, or there's a certain specific timeline. I I've not fallen victim to that the whole way along, which I think still allowed me to develop some ways of approaching things that, that are, that are effective with a wide range of dogs, including the dogs that aren't always perfect specimens, right. Uh, of what they're doing. Also, I, I think, you know, I was a relatively um, athletic person. I did lots of rock climbing and and ran track and all sorts of things like that. And so got into the decoy work and stuff early and really enjoyed playing with dogs. And so my mechanical skills are are relatively good, right? And, and, that, and I developed those when I was young. So now that I'm getting old and arthritic and my fingers don't straighten out anymore and that kind of thing, I can, I can still manage to move around a little bit and get it done. Did you have a mentor? 
I had a whole bunch of them, like, so not one person, but I collect, there were various people that I trained with at various times that had really big influences on me. Um, they were a little more like uh, collegial relationships. It wasn't so much early on, uh, like I took classes, but I would go to seminars and all that kind of stuff. But the people that had the biggest impact on me were people that I just trained around and picked up things and had discussions. So people like Ivan and I, or he had a huge influence on me at an early stage of my training. Um, we jived really quickly and kind of understood each other. So um, I took every opportunity to be around him and pick his brain. There's a there are people that nobody will know. Uh, Norm Bacher, which is a guy, a Schutzen guy in Southern California, um, wasn't a professional dog trainer, but was very talented. A woman named Mitzi Robinson, who was at the first club that I was at, also one of the first people to teach me to use food well in dog training. Um, my old partner in breeding, Lisa Mays, like in like all kinds of people. I, and so, and I was traveling a lot, so I got to encounter lots and lots of trainers like so once i started seminaring i've spent you know more than a decade traveling full time so then you get to see all kinds of people meet them talk about training with them watch them and i was what a sponge for that kind of stuff like ooh, that's a great idea like that makes perfect sense to me right if you had like a a, a young person or something like that that you know you had to make them the best dog trainer that they possibly could be where would you like point them what would what would you get them doing other than going to the michael ellis school <laughs> <laughs> so i would get them I, would, I could choose any one of a number of kind of really solid basic programs as a stepping off point something that had some structure to begin with and it could be a lot of different places you know it could be a dog training school it could be a club or something like that but it could be with a mentor um but they should go and they should learn that approach right and they should commit to it enough to learn the approach. And then as you gain some basic skills, the scales of dog training, right? Then at that point, I encourage people to just expose themselves to as many different trainers and trainer ideas as possible without changing what they're doing every time they do it, right? So go watch, look, listen, meet different dog trainers, pick and choose different ideas to play around with and kind of keep collecting it that way. Um, one of the big mistakes now is there's so many outlets for energy is that people don't stick with any one way of approaching things long enough to become fluent at it. And it's true that you shouldn't keep trying to do something that isn't working with a given dog. You should be flexible in that you have to go like, okay, this doesn't work as well with this kind of dog. I'm going to try this methodology, but you ha have to know if those methodologies aren't working because you're not good at them or because it's not the right one for the dog, right? And what happens a lot now, because there's so much training stuff and so many training ideas out there is people don't stay with the basics long enough to master them so that they can say, if this technique, the one that works most frequently isn't working for this dog, then I should try something different as opposed to I'm not executing this technique well, so it looks like it's not working. I should try something different. And there's something we used to call seminaritis, where somebody would go to a seminar and get some good ideas and then they change their entire training afterwards. And then six months later, they'd be at another seminar and then they're changing their whole training again. Like, oh, I'm starting this method now, which is consistency is a super important piece of dog training. So I would just encourage somebody to land somewhere with a methodology that's relatively well thought out and structured and stick with that for a bit until you feel like you've you've mastered those pieces and then keep an open mind and keep putting yourself out there who would be on your mount rushmore of dog trainers uh ivan would be on there for sure the guy's a genius he's a freaking savant um I'm trying to think of people that have i god there's some so many great dog trainers i'm just trying to think of people that uh um influence me a lot at a certain point right in my training right so for instance like i owe a nod to and i would like i have a hard time like saying this th this person should be one of the great dog trainers because i think there's a thousands of really good dog trainers out there mm -hmm. and it's what hits you at the right time in your development right so some of the most important ideas you're exposed to at the wrong time 
Like if you're not ready for them, you won't receive them. Somebody will say something or show you something and you're like, okay, that whatever, that makes sense. But I got no place to put that. And, you know, three years later, you're like, oh, that was really good advice. I didn't have any clue what I was talking about at that point in time. And so oh, throughout my career, there were certain spots where you encountered someone that really changed your way of thinking about things and moved me forward. And those people are on my Mount Rushmore because they changed me. Like, I'm not saying that they're they're, they're the, even the world's best dog trainers, but yeah, I, I guess I, I, I meant that. that though. I, I, uh, yeah, I needed I meant, that. I meant like, uh, maybe someone you don't even know, like, but who, who would be like, if you had, so, play... so for instance, Gene Donaldson, who wrote culture clash, right? Mm -hmm. Culture clash was a book and she's a force free person here at the San Francisco humane society. She has a huge following in that community. I think she's completely off the reservation way too. She's gone way too far that way. That book was really important at the time it came out. It was seminal and it changed the way a lot of people thought about dog training. And certainly as somebody that came up with it from very traditional dog training, when I read that, I'm like, wow, that all makes sense. And it really, really latched on. Um, Pamela Reed's uh, whose book Accelerated Learning is a learning theory book that is a really digestible book. And I probably read that thing 40 times, right? I give it to students. It's a it's not a new book now, but it's a really, and I read at the point I read that she did a really good job of explaining a lot of the science of behavior in a way that was totally digestible to me. It felt like coming from somebody, she had great examples. It was really easy to read. I'm like, Hey, this is great. Karen Pryor. I went to a seminar. The first clicker seminar I ever saw was her at a time when I'm like, I had not wrapped my head around conditioned reinforcers at the time. And so that sent it down a, a whole path. Right. And then for certain, there are endless people like that, where I met somebody at the right time in my life to send my training in a different direction or the way I think about dog training in a different direction. Stuart Hilliard, um, who I felt like I knew him well before I ever met him. And Stuart Hilliard, um, he runs the breeding program at, for the US military at Lackland Air Force Base, but he, he made some of the very early um, Schutzen training DVD videos. They were VHS tapes actually and in, in the eighties and nineties for canine training systems. So he had a whole series of those. He wrote a book called the uh, Schutzen um, with Susan Barwig back in the eighties. He was the first person to um, uh, bring French ring trainers to the U S the first French ring trainer se seminars in the United States were in the uh, mid eighties, 85 or 86 or something. And Stuart organized that uh, happening. And then he's been in the military for the last or working for the military for the last 25 years. But before I ever met him, I felt he had such a huge influence on me, like watching his decoy work, for instance, he was very demonstrative in his decoy work when he's working dogs, he'd, he'd threaten the dog and the dog would bark and he'd make these huge like reactions, like big overblown reactions to the dog. And I'm like, and at that time I was like, oh, your job is to react to the dog, the dog you're you're an actor your job is to empower the dog and you respond to what they do and to to bring it out and it was so obvious uh, to somebody more experienced but if you're starting out in that world like that was huge for me like completely changed how i was working dogs and protection work right uh and so there's all kinds of i guess i i <laughs> i meant like uh maybe i asked the question differently who was the most skilled dog trainer you ever saw? Like when you saw them, they were kind of like, it blew your mind. Like it was like, oh my God, like that's incredible. Like is this, or well, it doesn't even have to be one person, but like, uh, I, I guess I'm I'm thinking more about not like educators or anything like the most skilled mm -hmm. people that just blew your mind with their skill set. So um debbie zapia so me when i met her the first time like blown away she was way ahead of her time in terms of her obedience in in the igp world way ahead of her time um ivan like i have mentioned numerous times he's a savant every time i've been around ivan he he's the only dog trainer that i can think of off the top of my head that has done things i've watched him do things with dogs that felt like it shouldn't work. Yeah. 
and it worked right At almost every time that he chose a path that to go down it, and it was frequently outside my way of thinking about things at various spots and and um was successful with that i feel like he thinks like a dog in a sense and he's obviously uh, in incredibly skilled um there are loads of good technicians that i can think of so when uh Bart Ballone's early stuff, like right now, the heavy reliance on the e-collar stuff and the Napopo thing um, is turned into kind of a system, but he was a great dog trainer and an incredible technician. Also somebody that at the time uh, I first met him, he was way ahead of the rest of the world in terms of how he was using the electronic collar um, in, in that world, like completely changed my way of thinking about the electronic collar early on. And, and he did it kind of on his own with the Belgian ring club, Hoboken, and the club he was training with the, there was a lot of innovation there in, in thinking about that. And he was an excellent technician with, with dogs as well. Um, God, we could, we could talk about these things for hours. No, or somebody I'm loving it. I'm loving it. This yeah, is yeah, good. yeah. This is good. Yeah. But that's a good list. That is a good list. Um, similarly, and I'll make this my last question. <laughs> <laughs> is there a dog that stands out? Is there a one or is there, is there a dog that you've like, wow, that's the best dog I ever met or whatever. Yes. Same, same thing. This is a question. This is a discussion that friends and I have all the time. Like you met certain dogs at certain places in your development and they completely blew you away. Right. So the very first Belgian ring Malinois, that I saw uh, at the time, the dog whose name was Mustang or Milor. He was a Dupatois dog, uh, big dark dog. And um, the dog bit in a way that I'd never seen a dog bite like at all, like this huge crushing, like push forward, like couldn't swallow enough suit, like was trying to inhale it like an egg eating snake or something. And that dog made a giant impression on me at the time. Um, and that's happened at a variety of points throughout my life where you have a dog that you think this dog was amazing. I'm not sure now if I saw the dog now, whether I think the same thing, you know what I mean? Cause like I didn't know anything. So that made a giant impact. And later, and there was like, there was a Rottweiler that was in a club that I trained in the dog's name was Billy. And he was at the time just blew my mind. I'd never seen a Rottweiler or anything like it. He, had entries like a German shepherd to like, he was like, I'm like, what is this thing? I don't know if I saw him now, I'd be like, Oh, he's just a dog. Right. So there's that part of it. Like the dogs that impress you at a certain point. Um, the most, the, the dog that's probably closest to my heart is the, the dog you mentioned before Feist, which was, um, uh, my partner, Lisa Mays's French ring three, Mondi ring three, <laughs> IPO three dog. His sister was, Fautois was my dog and she was, a special creature for sure. Like she was a difficult dog in a lot of ways, but also a unique dog. And, um, she like, I, I if I could have her again over and over again, I, I, I would, <laughs> yeah, she was remarkable. Like she was super aggressive. Um, but really, really remarkably responsive and easy to live with away from the fact that you just had to keep her from biting people, but she was like, just the way her brain worked was remarkable. She was so easy, like around the house, you could just go, Hey, don't do that. And she'd be like, okay. But then when she got in work mode, she was out of her mind, like just completely <laughs> over the top. And that, that, that trait that you see sometimes in Malinois and you see it on other dogs, I'm sure, but seemed to me kind of unique in Malinois, their intense, the desire to bite and do those things and their intensity in the protection work and their responsiveness and sensitivity to the handler out of drive and in life, right? They're really quite um, sensitive creatures that way to their people and emotionally sensitive more frequently than physically sensitive. And, and they care about that kind of stuff. And that was to me um, really unusual because a lot of good German shepherds, if they were good solid dogs in the work, they weren't sensitive to their handlers off the field in any way they didn't really care if you were upset or not <laughs> whereas the malinois definitely do and so that, that my first some of my first exposure to that was really influential oh. well 
this is a good place to wrap it up <laughs> this is a really really cool episode so i appreciate it thanks so much for coming on oh my pleasure nick it was really nice to talk to you so yeah. thanks Fantastic. for having me yeah. all right thanks for coming on see you take care